Ukraine is fighting its own battle and we are supporting Ukraine as a sovereign country to try and regain totally its own territory. But that's not going to wish the threat from Russia away. Uh, even if Putin goes and is replaced by someone else, we've got a very aggressive Russia at the present moment, and therefore it's incumbent on NATO to make sure we have strong deterrent forces to make sure there is no further expansion. Yes, I think that 40% are right. Um, <clears throat> of course, it makes you wonder what the other 60% think. But, uh, <laughs> well, I think that there aren't many people who think that it's uh, that the uh, the armed forces are too small, uh, put it that way. Uh, 22%, so it's about the right size. 31% uh, said they didn't know. Uh, and the rest uh, said it was uh, the, the, uh, the armed forces were too large. So, yeah, it's a big, the biggest group think that it's too small. The serious point, of course, is that 40% is right, in my view, and that view is shared by many people. Indeed, last week we had a debate in the House of Lords. There were 29 speakers, and all 29 speakers in the House of Lords, perhaps fairly predictably, all argued that we should be spending more, more money on defence. And you ask yourself the question, why? Well, thank you, don't have to look very far. And we see a very bloody war being fought in Ukraine. Uh, yes, uh, the government's um, integrated review, which was published in 21 and refreshed earlier this year, talked about a tilt towards the Indo-Pacific, and that's fine. That's recognising the competition, the challenge from, from China. But then, of course, we have got this bloody war in Ukraine, and we have to remember that we are a European country, that we play an important part in the security, infrastructure and architecture of, of Europe. And many other countries... Poland in particular, are significantly increasing their defence expenditure, um, and we're not. And, and there is a parallel here, and I, I do come back to the parallel we draw in my book, um, Victory to Defeat, 1918 to 1940. Uh, how was it that we, with allies, beat the Germans in 1918, and less than 22 years later, we were our army was defeated in France in May, June 1940? And you just look at the paucity of expenditure on our armed forces, and particularly on the army in the interwar years. Now, these figures are interesting. In 1935, we in this country were spending 3% of GDP on defence. Currently, it's just over 2%. But in 1939, when the bad stuff hit the fan, it had to shoot up to 18%. And in 1940, it was 46%. Now, do we want to run the risk of having to learn the lessons of history again? Or should we not be increasing our defence expenditure now to make sure that this country and our people are secure against not just a threat in Europe, but actually an aggressive dictator who's already launched a vicious war? But the, the, a counterpoint would be that part of the reason why the, the, arm, the armed forces are shot, I think it was down to 152,000 now. About half of those are in the army and the rest are split between the, the Navy and the RAF. Is the... That Britain is not about to embark on another Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, the political... I mean, we couldn't even get involved in Syria. The political will to 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 launch an offensive like that just isn't there, regardless of what, what might happen abroad. And nobody's really realistically expecting anyone to invade Britain. So although there are, you know, clearly there are issues about providing, you know, military support and, and probably money to Ukraine, it's not the same situation as the 1930s, is it? It's not the same situation, but there are strong similarities. Yeah. Um, we are a key member of NATO. Yeah. Um, now, Ukraine is not a NATO member. Ukraine is fighting its own battle, and we are supporting Ukraine as a sovereign country to try and regain totally its own territory. But that's not going to wish the threat from Russia away. Uh, even if Putin goes and is replaced by someone else, we've got a very aggressive Russia at the present moment, and therefore it's incumbent on NATO to make sure we have strong deterrent forces to make sure there is no further expansion. Now, I go back to the analogy of the interwar years. After the First World War, there was an absolute determination that that had been the war to end all wars, yeah. and there was a government policy, there would be no major war for 10 years, and that rolled on year on year on year. Consequently, when Hitler became a threat from 1933 onwards, and he pushed, uh, reoccupied the Rhineland, invaded Sudetenland, ch took off a chunk of Czechoslovakia, we had no army that we could deploy to say to him, stop. And there is a very strong argument that if we had deployed an expeditionary force of, say, four to six divisions, along with the French, that would have caused Hitler to back down and we may never have got as far as having to fight the Second World War. You're absolutely right. We can't see anyone wanting to attack this country at the present moment. But you can't ever predict the future. Russia is an aggressive threat. 
And then, of course, remember that this country is one of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, G7, G20, all those international obligations. So who knows where we're going to find ourselves having to deploy troops in the future. It was only 10, 12 years ago when I was the army chief that we were fighting campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan. Who can say never again? And is that the problem, that because the prospect of a war is so awful, there's a tendency maybe amongst politicians and the public to think everything everything will work out all right in the end, as it was 18 months ago. Of course, Putin's never going to actually invade Ukraine. It's a, you know, it's a constant, it's a posture. That actually we need to hope for the best and prepare for the worst. It's fine to hope for the best, but you, as long as you do prepare properly for the, best, for, the, for, for the worst. Professor Sir Michael Howard famously said, the thing about predicting the future is not to be so wrong that when the future reveals itself, you can't adjust very quickly. And what that translates in, in military terms is to make sure that as a nation, we've got a capable set of armed forces that have a, a wide variety of capabilities, that whatever the challenge is that's thrown at us, whether it's close to home or defending a vital interest further away, we've got the capability to contribute. Now, almost certainly contribute with allies in an alliance like NATO or a coalition basis rather like the two Gulf Wars, but to make sure that we can maintain our international obligations. Do you think as a country we need to prepare for the the prospect that we will would see British troops deployed in a conflict in the foreseeable future? I'm absolutely certain we will see British troops deployed in a conflict at some point in the future. Now, one can't put um, a time scale on it. I can't put a, a geographic location on it. But um, history shows us that there is an inevitability, as much as we'd like to think we live in peace and security, and we'll do so for all time. That is just not how the real world is. Yeah. So a, a responsible government ought to make proper provision. <clears throat> and, uh, and the argument is, I mean, let's face it, Grant Chaps has now come in as Defence Secretary. When he was bidding to be Prime Minister, he was talking about spending 3% of GDP on defence. Um, we are somewhere between 2% and 2.5%. And um, so, Mr Chaps, um, are you going to uh, live up to your words or, or are you going to um, listen to what the Chancellor says and says, well, sorry, Grant, we can't afford any more? Actually with the threat that we have facing us in, in Europe, the responsible thing to do is to spend more on defence and particularly to spend more on our army. And again, <laughs> go back to the lessons of yeah. the interwar years in, in the book. That's exactly the message that we're trying to put across. That actually investing early prevents might prevent huge investment later um, and spending. I want to ask you about this question that some people have raised about Grant Shapps and his suitability. People liked Ben Wallace because he'd served himself... Uh, he was a military man and he'd been at defence for a long time. He did security before that. Um, a couple of examples of questions being raised about Grant Shapps understanding the military. This is him talking about aircraft carriers. Our military today has the biggest warships that it's ever had. Those aircraft carriers are the largest uh, carriers the, the RAF's ever had. People pointing out the, the, the aircraft carriers belong to the Navy, uh, not the RAF. He was also asked how many ranks there are in the Army. <laughs> not off the top of my head, but on your main... <laughs> question. Uh, what I would say is, look, what the Ministry of Defence needs is highly experienced cabinet ministers who can run a, a complex infrastructure. So it's slightly turned into a bit of a parlour game. Can you catch Grant Shapps out asking him defence questions? Does it matter not having a defence, a military man at defence, any more than it matters not having a teacher at education or a doctor at health? No, it doesn't matter at all. What, what does matter is whether uh, any incoming Secretary of State for Defence is prepared to do their homework very early on, to listen carefully to the myriad of briefings that they will get, to take advice from the rest of his ministerial team, which in this case are, are very experienced, as indeed the senior civil servants are, and critically to form a good early relationship with the service chiefs, the chief of the defence staff and the heads of the three services, and be prepared to listen. And when defence works well is when the Secretary of State gets on delivering the politics and the service chief get on delivering the military capability. Keep that in lockstep, the thing will work well. So I just wait with interest to see how Mr Shapps get on. Uh, I wish him all the very best. It's a complex and a difficult portfolio uh, in defence, but I hope he does well. Ben Wallace did it well for four years. Yes, he's an ex-soldier, but um, I worked for, or have worked with many secretaries of state for defence, most of whom didn't have military experience. It's fine, provided that good relationship is there.
Uh, just stay with us. We've been sort of looking back at the, the history uh, and what we can learn from history. Let's look to the future as well. We could bring in Elizabeth Braw, a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, who's on the line. Hi, Elizabeth. Good morning. Um, I just wonder your, your reflections on what Lord, Lord Dannett was saying about the need for the armed forces you know, to grow, to match the threat of Russia, and learning those lessons from, from history. What, what for you do you think the future looks like? Is it is as gloomy as it, as it was in the 1930s? Well, it's certainly gloomy, but, it, but it's gloomy in different ways, or perhaps additional ways. Uh, perhaps additional ways, which is that we face not just the, the, the threats that, that uh, Chamberlain saw in, in, in the 30s and, and other politicians, but uh, non-military threats as well that are growing. And I don't I think I don't need to remind anybody of what those threats are. But uh, and uh, Lord Annette, I, I'll, I'll absolutely agree with you uh, that uh, when when uh, Chamberlain, when he felt that he couldn't uh, he couldn't stand up against Hitler, it was because he didn't have armed forces that were big enough to do that at that point. And so he had to wait and, and then he was seen as an appeaser. But if I may add this, Matt, um, a crucial piece is, here is convincing the UK or talking, having a conversation with the UK public about what the armed forces do and what, uh, how much the UK public is willing to spend. Because at the moment, the UK public it likes the armed forces. In fact, uh, they, they really respect them. It's one of the most respected institutions in the UK. But, but the, the average citizen doesn't know what the armed forces do. And I was just looking at the, the British Legion survey. 80 percent uh, think the armed forces do a good job. 69 percent don't know what the armed forces do. Uh, and I suppose, I suppose that's the thing. It's actually 73 percent, I think, in our poll said that they still support Britain's uh, efforts to support uh, Ukraine. They say that they think the armed forces are too small. But yeah, you, I suspect if we asked them how, how large the armed forces, we might have had a slightly different answer. Is there a point, um, Elizabeth, I know you look at some of the the, the hybrid and grey zone threats as they're, as they're known. Yeah, we're seeing... The, the much of the fighting in Ukraine being fought by by drones and, and so on. Do we need a huge army, boots on the uh, boots on the ground, if you like, when 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 technology is changing the nature of warfare? Well, see, this is the the the, the really challenging part that we need. Uh, both uh, both kinds, and the question is who should do the non-kinetic part. So the armed forces are very good at, at military defense, clearly, but who's supposed to do the other part? And at, at, at the moment, we are not really we, we don't have a government department or agency that does defense against non-kinetic threats. Obviously, we have uh, intelligence agencies, but we don't have agencies that that uh, that detect and counter subversion of all kinds, or indeed. Uh, aggression of a, of a non-military kind. And so there has always been this expectation that whatever happens, the armed forces will take care of it, including when there is there are prob problems stocking supermarket shelves. People think that, oh, you know, we can always uh, uh, ask the British Army to do it if, if nothing else works. <laughs> well, the, the armed forces aren't big enough to do that too if they are supposed to do the military defence that is their expertise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we should